Okay, we're ready to get started. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining our third virtual workshop. We're super excited to have Satya Malik, the CEO of OpenCV, here to explore how to deploy computer vision on depth cameras. Before we get started, uh, please make sure your laptops and your edge devices are set up to follow along during the walkthrough tutorial. You will need an Always AI account to follow along, so if you haven't done so already, please take another look at your emails for the device setup instructions, as well as the link to sign up to Always AI. We have allocated a few of our staff members to answer questions along the way. So if you have questions, just submit them using the Q&A button in the Zoom application below. We have disabled the chat feature, um, and, and at this point, we're not acknowledging any raised hands. But if you have questions or any additional thoughts, feel free to join our Discord channel. The link to this is also available in your most recent email. Uh, finally, we're going to spend about 10 minutes answering a list of uh, selected questions live. So if you have any questions for Satya, Marty, Steve, or Taiga, uh, stick around till the end and we'll do our best to address as many questions live as possible. So with that, we're ready to get started. I'd like to hand it to Marty Beard, the Chief Executive Officer of Always AI. Marty? Okay, thanks, thanks, Komal. Uh, hi, everybody. So we're uh, we're we're super excited about today. Um, this, as Komal mentioned, it's our third webinar. Um, you know, the first was really an overview of computer vision, and also of the uh, Always AI platform. And then we uh, we asked the community what else they were interested in, and the second webinar focused on pose estimation, uh, and that was that was really fun. But uh, today we're we're really excited to see so much interest, um, uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of you that are interested in today's uh, topic, uh, depth camera and spatial AI techniques. I think we all know, you know, a simple example of a, of a robot that is picking items needs to understand distance uh, when it's grabbing that item. I mean, that's just a very simple example and we're gonna go through a whole bunch today, but this is clearly gonna be a major, major part of the technology stack uh, moving forward. For those of you that are new to Always AI, um, you know, we exist to help you, the developer, uh, create, deploy, and maintain computer vision apps on edge devices, like IoT devices. Uh, our product is live, as many of you are already using it, and it's available available now. Um, it's basically got a model catalog that you can leverage. It's got a robust set of APIs to help you customize your app, uh, and also provides you the ability to run and deploy on many uh, ARM-based edge devices, as well as x86 and, and Macs, et cetera. Um, we are really excited about going into an early beta on uh, model retraining, and that is a service that we'll be introducing over the next uh, month or so. We, uh, we work really, really closely with the AI and the computer vision ecosystem, and today we're super honored to have uh, OpenCV, one of the largest communities in the world around computer vision, join us for this uh, today's topic. Uh, OpenCV is a really important part of, of the Always AI platform, and it helps us in, in, in several different ways, but it's an integral part of, of what we do, and we know that our developers really appreciate that we work closely with, with the organization. So Como, if you could please go to the agenda slide. Let me just kind of quickly walk through this. Um, you know, we're, OpenCV is going to introduce some new depth camera kits and specialized AI solutions. I won't steal such as thunder, but we're really excited to hear about that. Uh, our own Taiga Shida is going to then walk through some common use cases of depth cameras and spatial AI techniques, but he's also going to demonstrate how Always AI works with third party edge devices like the OpenCV uh, camera kits that we're going to hear about today. Then we're going to go into the bulk of the webinar. Uh, our CTO, Steve Grisette, is going to give a, a real hands-on uh, live demo of the Intel RealSense camera and how we are leveraging, uh, how the, that camera is leveraging the Always AI platform to do some amazing things in this spatial AI space. Stay tuned for that. There's some really, really cool stuff that we're going to demo. So without uh, further ado, we can go to the next slide. Let me introduce uh, Satya. I think as we already mentioned, he's the CEO of OpenCV. Uh, many of you know Satya, he's a, a very active community leader 
uh, in the computer vision space, whether it's LinkedIn or, or Twitter or through OpenCV and other social networks. Uh, he is Dr. Malik. He's got a PhD in computer vision uh, from UCSD, but he's, he's also been an entrepreneur, uh, starting uh, several companies and, and running those companies successfully. So without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Satya. Thanks, Marty. Really appreciate uh, uh, the introduction. And I'm really grateful and thankful to be um, in front of your audience. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, frankly, we are very excited to be in collaboration with Always AI. It's a great platform to deploy uh, you know, AI models to edge devices, and you're making it really easy so I'm really excited about this collaboration when Oak D, which is our smart camera with depth, is available to the general public, it will be supported by Always AI. So I'm really excited about that. But uh, today I'm here to announce uh, some other exciting things that we are doing. Uh, let's move on to the next. Um, so I wanted to announce OpenCV AI kit with depth. So there are two cameras that we are going to come out this summer. One of them is called OpenCV AI Kit or OAK. And the second one is called OpenCV AI Kit with depth. The second was, one is very interesting. As you can see in the picture, it has a 12 megapixel camera in the center and it has a built-in chip that does neural inference. It is based on Mediate X and uh, MediaX runs on the RGB frame. And you also see two cameras which form a stereo pair. And using these two cameras, we are able to estimate depth. So it's a true spatial AI solution where based on the neural network you're running, you could do object detection. And so you know what objects are there in the scene, but based on the depth map that is produced by these cameras, we also know how far these objects are from the image. And you can pretty much run any um, neural network that is supported by OpenVINO on this device. The beauty of this device is that all the computation is happening on the device and your host to which this camera is connected is free to do other things. Um, most of the computation load is done by the device directly. So the camera takes a picture, uh, and whatever model you have loaded onto the uh, device uh, that gets executed and the frame, you know, if you have an object detection module, then that happens. And in addition to that, you also have depth for every frame. So you can combine all this information. The open CV. Uh, so now I want to, um, I want to show you a small video uh, that explains all this information uh, in a nicer way with uh, you know demos etc let's go ahead the OpenCV ai kit was created to improve safety using artificial intelligence and the platform has grown to become the perfect starting point whether you're new to computer vision or a professional looking for an easy path to productization the software is coming soon to the OpenCV repository free and open source as ever the hardware comes in two distinct flavors OAK1 and OAKD. And setup is so simple it can be accomplished in 30 seconds. Both modules can run complicated neural networks using 4 trillion operations per second of visual processing. Record 4K video at 30 frames per second and track multiple objects or people simultaneously. The depth variant, OAKD, can do all of that plus report the physical position of tracked items in 3D space unlocking new powers for embedded spatial AI. Both of these groundbreaking hardware modules are coming very soon. Sign up for the newsletter at opencv.org to be the first to know. All right, so you could see in the demo that there was a depth map and as well as, you know, this uh, device has the capability of computing uh, or doing neural inference on the device. So let's move on to the next uh, slide. The okay, now you may be thinking, how do you get your hands on this device? So we have three options. The first option is something that we launched 
today or yesterday. It is OpenCV Spatial AI Competition. This is a competition sponsored by Intel. And based on the capability of the device that you saw, we want you to come up with some real world application that would be stunning, that would surprise us, some really cool application for this device. It should be a spatial AI solution. So you first send us a proposal and based on that proposal, we will select 15 winners. These 15 winners will be given a free Oak D. We will ship you a free Oak D uh, smart camera. You will also get access to Intel's dev cloud for one month and we will support this project that you have described in the proposal uh, using, you know, on our Slack channel. If you have any questions, we will help you sort out those problems with uh, the smart camera. And the application deadline is July 13th. So come up with some great solution that you want, uh, put it in the proposal and also tell us something about your team. You can have a team of up to four people so tell us what you have accomplished so far so that we can judge whether this team will be capable uh, uh, on executing the proposal. So that's the prelims round and 15 teams will be selected for the finals. And for the finals, you have one month to actually build uh, your application. And once you have built the application, we will select three people uh, who will receive the first, second and third prizes. The first prize is $3,000. The second prize is $2,000 and the third prize is $1,000 and Intel is sponsoring this uh, competition. So if you feel that you have an edge, you should just uh, compete in this. I really appreciate, I would really appreciate, you know, even people who don't think they have a very good chance, they should try because this competition can, you know, change the trajectory of your career. A lot of people will know if you win this competition. So give it a try. The second option, um, can we move on to the next slide? The second option to buy uh, this uh, OpenCV AI uh, kit is the Kickstarter campaign, which will go live on July 14th. And this will be a heavily discounted price, 50% um, of the original price. So that's another way and make sure that you get the early bird discount because it will be limited by the number of units. We pretty much don't make any money on the early bird pricing. So please uh, be early there and uh, grab uh, a unit for yourself. So that's the second option. The third option is based on luck. So if you subscribe to our newsletter uh, on July 6th, we are going to announce five winners for OpenCV AI kit with depth. Uh, and those winners will receive a free uh, kit as well. So those are uh, the three options. Now, uh, Taiga is going to give a demo, but uh, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, so that's Taiga's slide. So Taiga is going to give a demo of, uh, of Oak D, where you can see the depth as well as uh, neural inference happening on the device. But before I leave, I want to thank uh, the Always AI team again, and I encourage you to use their platform. Uh, they are really doing cutting edge stuff on, <laughs> you know, it's cutting edge and it's also deployed on the edge. So you have these two um, interesting things going on. Their uh, solution allows you to deploy AI models on the edge. Uh, and you know when OpenCV AI kit launches formally, uh, they will also support our kit. So I'm very thankful for, for that. Uh, let's move on to the demo, Taiga. Thank you, Satya. Um, yeah, so before I go on to the demo, I kind of want to just talk about spatial AI and some of its use cases. Now, you know, if you're familiar with machine learning models, like you'll know that its outputs are given 2D and it's just fixed coordinates. And so that's, that's if you want to make, make basic applications such as like a face counter, like a people counter or something like that, you know, that's fine and all. But if you, if you want to do something, you know, like say in these situations and the times we're in, you want to do something that's, you know, like a people distance, like tracking application for the social distancing stuff, 
yeah, you're gonna want to get some depth measurements so you can accurately uh, measure the distance between each individual object that you're seeing there. So that's real. So yeah, I highly recommend having a depth sensor in your hardware stack to just kind of give a leg up on your computer vision applications. And so some of the use cases for depth cameras and stuff like that, the first one is navigation and mapping. And so in order for you to have a navigate, um, a robot navigate its environment properly, you're gonna want to have a mapping of that robot surrounding. And that's what the depth camera is gonna allow you to do. Using the depth camera, you can make a, you know, you can make a good mapping of its surroundings and then, and then navigate that um, mapping with clear intentions. So yeah, it's really good for navigation and mapping. And then the collision avoidance also goes along with that. You know, when you're out there navigating and it's unmanned robot, it's just navigating itself, you definitely want to avoid some stuff that can harm that robot. So you can train an AI model to detect objects that he wants to avoid. And then using a depth camera, you can ensure that the robot is not getting too close to that object where it could potentially hurt it. And so going on, scene understanding, that kind of follows up with mapping, but in like the reverse way. For scene under understanding, it's kind of like localization. And so that's the awareness. It's giving the robot awareness of where it is in the mapping. And that's also very important when you're, you know, navigating and doing stuff in robotics. And so the last one is object manipulation. So like Marty said at the beginning, like in order, if you have a robotic arm and a factory line, you kind of want to, it needs to sort and pick up items fastly and sort them. You, you're going to want some depth measurements so you can accurately pick up that object. And so, yeah, so those are some of the use cases of depth cameras at a high level. So let me just share my screen now so we can go on to the demo. Here, okay, so let me open up the terminal. And jump to the webinar directory here. So with this, I'm using the always AI CLI to deploy locally. So I've installed. I have start. So this one right here, the screen that I'm moving now is your traditional RGB stream and then so I'm running pose estimation using always AI platform here. And so that's what that looks like. And then on the left here is what we have the depth stream. And so the reason why it looks like that is because we're using OpenCV to map the depth measurements into a color spectrum. So the closer, the filter I'm using shows the closer objects in light blue, whereas the, the further it gets, it goes into a darker blue. And so that's what the um, depth stream and our, you know, that's what the depth stream looks like. And then it's your traditional RGB stream here. So now I want to just pass it over to Steve so that he can kind of talk about our API surrounding the RealSense camera. And then so that you guys can implement some of the use cases that I've talked about today. Thank you, Taiga. So now we're going to start the, the hands-on portion of our, uh, a webinar and we'll be opening up our IDEs and we'll be uh, we'll be coding away here in, in a little bit. But let me kind of get some uh, starting pieces here and some background stuff. So um, all the code we're going to be using is up in our GitHub site here. And anyway, on the application it, or across our platform ourselves, we have a lot of sample applications up here. And I just want to make people aware of that resource. And a lot of these sample, like the YMCA app, where we use pose estimation to do the YMCA. Uh, is available here, but also if you go into our home page, we have a lot of blogs and within those blogs we have tutorials that show people how to do those different things that's tied into that 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 particular uh, or into that into those those uh, github uh, pieces. So let's go and uh, let me go ahead and let's focus back on what we're doing today, which is the spatial AI, AI webinar. We're going to be using the RealSense camera and we're going to be using the Pi 4 device. Now, the reason we're going to be using a, a Pi 4 as the base is that's the Pi that, that actually offers USB 3.0. And so when you're using one of these depth cameras like the Oak or like 
the real sense camera, you're going to need to use USB 3.0 because you're going to be pulling a lot of data across into the system. system. Now, the other thing I want to do on, on background, every type of, of uh, API you see today, we will match that when the, when the OPD is, is, is available and, and the plus one. We will offer also the Open Vino, which is the, um, uh, uh, the inferencing engine. We have Open Vino support in, but once that camera's released, uh, we'll go ahead and build another pipeline for that particular camera. But today you can hook in the USB stick and you can see how your models are going to perform on OpenVINO. So we absolutely support Intel's OpenVINO today in the platform. So anyway, so let's go ahead and let's, let's clone our repository and get started. Um, so we're coming down here and this is how you can clone the platform. You can either use uh, GitHub's desktop, you can download a zip and unzip it, or you can use their command line utilities. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, use their command line. So I'm going to say git clone, and I'm going to spell clone right, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to paste that in, and boom. Steve, excuse now, me. I don't think we're seeing your screen. Oh, my apologies on that. So. So sorry. There we go. So sorry about that. So let me go. <laughs> so I apologize on that. Um, so I had a really good monologue with myself here, or at least on, on what I was doing on my PC. But anyway, what I wanted to show you is we do have this GitHub repository. I'll go back and recap that with all kinds of sample applications that are tied to our blog sites. So you can go into tutorials there. So there's a lot of resources up on the Always AI platform. Uh, on this blog site, we're gonna go into the spatial AI and we're gonna go ahead and we're going to clone this. Um, I've already done that, but you would wanna copy here, or use a desktop or download a, a zip file. So let's go ahead now and get started. And now we're sharing. So uh, I uh, downloaded the, the, sample, the sample applications and so I wanna move into those samples applications folder. So I'm going to go into the spatial AI webinar thing. And what I want to do is review our workflow. Uh, we have that in, in uh, webinar one, but I want to go back through it. And I'm going to take a object detector. And we're going to go into that ob object detector uh, subfolder. And now I want to run through uh, uh, our, our workflow process on our command line system. So I'm going to start out by, first of all, configuring the system. And what configuration is going to do is set up for the target environment it's going to, either, either locally uh, on your Windows or Mac system, or go out and, and set up a target situation for the uh, edge device. So let's go through and do that. We'll run the command. And so now what it's asking me on the targeting is, is what's the name of the user I'm gonna to deploy to out on, on my edge device? or and and its host name. So I'm going to go ahead and set up pi and then I'm going to reference it with an with, with a, a, a IP address today. And so now what happens here is it's going to connect through SSH. It's going to check to see if the docker is there. Uh, the Docker system has been set up and then whether we have the correct permissions. And if you follow our guides that I showed you over there on the blog, I'll, that you can get that and get all that set up. Now it's going to ask me for my default path, where do I want to deploy the application to? And I'm just going to choose that, or what path I want to. I'm going to choose the default. So it's created that directory on the target and now it has our, our JSON configuration file. File. So the next thing is now we've set up for targeting and deploy. So of course, the next thing we want to do is actually deploy the application. So we're going to come in and use the word deploy. Now this is where the workflow varies. If you're running locally on a Windows machine or a Mac machine or a Linux desktop, you're, or actually I should say just on those two platforms, you're going to want to do an install. And if you're having trouble with any of the local stuff, we have people out there, our engineers online, that can tell you how to handle the variation of the workflow. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy the system, and we'll go through that. So again, it's, it's copying the application to the target device. Now what it's going to do is check to see whether it has the Docker image yet. And if it doesn't have the Docker image, it's going to build it. Now something I want to point out here is 
our Edge IQ, which is our, our core library system, it needs to be on version uh, uh, 0.14.2. That has the RealSense camera support into the system. system. So if you don't have that, go ahead and reach out to our, our, our technicians and they'll be able to tell you how to upgrade your platform and so forth. So the last of it is, is the Docker image has been built and then we've installed the ML model we're gonna use and it's built your virtual environment for you. So let's go ahead and start. And so this is just gonna be a standard object detector and let's take a look at it. Takes a little bit here on the loading part. And so there we go. So now it's loaded up and I'm gonna go over to our streamer which, which, is our Flask, which is our Flask server that pushes out from the container uh, to the web. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at it. So now we can see, let me come, kind of move this up a little bit. So now what we can see is an object detector looking, looking out on, onto the, uh, um, the world around it. So here's our robot looking out into the world. And what it sees from just a generic webcam, it sees the cups, it sees some books back here in, in the, in, in the bookcase, but what I'm missing is any spatial information. So, and that that's, gets really important. So how would a robot know how to react to the environment around it? It knows what's out there and what it's interested in, but it doesn't know how far things are from it. So this is where these depth cameras uh, come into play here. And what we have is a, a real sense depth camera that we've built support for. So I'm gonna ask you to hold on one second so I can plug that camera in. I'm going to plug it into my, so, oh boy. so I plug that camera into my USB port. And so what we're going to build into the application, take this object detector and add spatial, what we're going to try to build is, let me go into our, our sample code and show you before we actually build it, is we're going to go into RealSense object detector here, and we'll start to look at what that looks like from a spatial point of view. So now we're moving into the RealSense camera and we'll take a look at what it has. So now in the RealSense camera, if we take a look here, what we now have is depth information. So now our robot knows how far the chair is and how far the cups are and how far the book. So for example, that book back in the bookcase is, is about 4.5 meters away while the cups sit around about 0.7 meters and the chair itself is sitting at, at, at close to one meter. So now our robot has has a uh, spatial information to it. So now, how do we go about doing that in the always AI platform? So let's open our IDEs and then let's go in and I'm gonna go ahead and let's go into our, our, our spatial uh, repository and let's take a look at the object detector. So if we look at, I'm gonna get rid of these welcome things too because they're kind of, they're, they're not annoying right now actually. So let's go in there and we'll take a look at, this is a standard always AI object code uh, that's in any of our sample applications. And what we see right here is we have the webcam. This is starting the webcam object uh, and so forth. So what we wanna do is not start a webcam, but start a real sense. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's go into our API documentation. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna go to our homepage and I'm gonna go into our docs. Now, our docs are organized so that they have all the API information down here on Edge I, A, API uh, documentation. So if you want to learn about the object detection that we had, you can watch our first webinar or you can go into the actual documentation there. We're gonna drop down and take a look at the RealSense camera. So what we see here is the class that we want to instantiate uh, for this. And so this is the RealSense uh, uh, object that we wanna start. So now we go back to our code and we're gonna come in here and we're gonna change this. And we're gonna call this real sense because that's the name of the class. So now we're gonna instantiate the class. The real sense uh, object goes out and it looks for serial numbers to instantiate the, the, the camera. So uh, it will find the first serial number and then, then do that camera. If you have multiple cameras, you can look in at our basic operation and it, it shows you how to, to pick up the serial number using our enumerate devices uh, function. And then you can run multiple real sense cameras if you want. 
Now, what always AI has done with, with outside devices that it tries to hook into from the streamer to the real sense camera, the web, is we've used a design pattern called context manager. So what's nice within the context manager is we can use that within this with state with the start uh, single device or multiple devices. So you don't have to go through like we do here down in the, in the find the frames per second. We don't have to do a start command. Uh, with that paradigm. We just have to put them in the with statement and we can stack up as many devices as we want to start. So now we've uh, initiated the object. So now we need to come down into this loop detection. That's where we pull things from the camera and send things to the object detector, which is right there. So the first thing I want to do is go back to my APIs and, and, and see what comes back from the read uh, uh, method. So I come down and I take a look. And so from the read method, what I see I'm going to return, in this case, my RGB, my, my color image, just like I get from a webcam. And what I'm going to get is a depth image that has depth information to it. So as I go into my code, what I want to change here is I actually want to add in a depth image and a color image. And it, and it is a tuple and it does need to be in that order. So now I'm reading in from my, my video stream, I'm reading in a color image and a depth image. Now I want to take that color image because that's replacing the, the frame image coming in. And that's, the, that's what I want to do my object detection against. So now I'm going to go through the program and change the frame to color image. And I'm going to walk us through each, each one that needs to be changed. But you can use your, your uh, find and replace functions within, within your um, uh, IDE if you want to. So anyway, right here is the markup image. And what the markup function does in our code is it goes ahead and when you see the boxes and, and all the confidence level and what the detector is doing, that's what the markup image does. So I'm going to go ahead and change the output to color image and then the input to that to color image. So now I've changed my detector and my markup. And then the last thing I want to do is you notice we display out in what we call the streamer. So that's the flash server that's coming out and pushing data out to the web. So I need to change that and also uh, put in my color image. So now I've done all the basic changes that I want to do uh, to get the RealSense camera to render in, in, in this uh, object detector. But I also want to get distance information in, into this application, so the spatial information. So because this is Python, one of the easiest ways to do this is create, an, create a variable or create a, a list file. And so I'm going to store my distances in a list, and I'm going to call it, uh, oddly enough, distances. So now I have a list where I want to stay, uh, keep the uh, um, uh, depth information from my detections. The next thing I want to do is go back to my API doc and see exactly how I do that. So if I start to scroll through, I see this uh, API here and method behind it that says compute object distance. And what that does is we, we input a bounding box to it from our object detector, and then we, we push in the depth image. And what that will do is then give us the distance back to that detected object in meters. So we're on the metrics today, people. So it's meters. So let me go in. And so actually, let me go back because we really don't want to see my horrid typing skills at work. So I'm just going to copy this. So um, to get that, I see I, I, I need to go through and loop through the predictions. So I need to set up a for loop. That's the next thing I need to do. So, so let me go ahead and set up a for loop to do this. So I'm going to set up a for loop that does predictions in results. So I get a results object back here from my object detector. And part of the properties is this prediction right here. So I want to put in the results predictions. So I'll do that and then type in predictions. So now I have that. Now I need to store in this distance object that I have or this distance uh, list that I have, I need to store in it. So one of the properties of a list is to append it. So as I loop through this, I want to append that list with the information based on the prediction I see. So I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to type out my distance. 
list and then I'm going to append to it. And what I want to do is I have, I know I'm, I've, I've instantiated my object and called it video stream. So I want to, for the real sense camera, so I want to say video stream. And then I want to punch it, uh, uh, reference that, that method within that uh, class object. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. So now I'm my compute object distance. So I have that. Um, and then I want to neaten things up here before I go too far. So I'm going to go in here. And that's just a neatness thing so I can read it down down better on, on the code. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick. But my box that I wanna get is gonna be a prediction.box. So I want that instance of it as we loop through. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the prediction and I'm gonna do the dot box. So now what I have, I'm looping through for each one of my, my detections within, within the object detector, I'm gonna go ahead and add distances by going through this loop. Now the next piece I want to do to the code to change this object detector into giving us spatial information is I want to get the streamer. So right down here in this section of the code is where we generate the information for the streamer. So in this particular section is where we're putting all the object detection predictions up. So I want to change this to get in the distance information. And this prediction goes through and it, it, it takes information from the results objects and puts in the individual one that that I want to also put in another indexing in besides predictions and I want to index into my distance. So I'm going to add a variable I. And so because I want to do two here, I'm going to have to enumerate this. So I'm going to go ahead and enumerate this. So boom, we come out here. So now we've enumerated that object. So now I want to start getting information appended to my text that's going to be shipped out to my browser. So right here, this information is the object. We can see that down the label, and this is the predictions. But because we're doing so much information now, I'm going to call this the conf I should say confidence, excuse me on that, confidence information. So I put in the variable and tell us that that's confidence. Now the next thing I want to add in is my distance information. And I want to take a look at it. So I'm going to go back to my a APIs because I've forgotten something. What does it return to me? Well, it returns to me a float. So I'm going to go ahead and format for that float. Well, confidence is also a float. So I'm going to use that particular formatting for meters. because so they're both returning me floats. And I think this will give me enough information on the meters to the, to the uh, significant figures that I want. Now, on the format command, I'm bringing in the different variables and what's missing is a distance variable. And I'm gonna go ahead and type in distances. So I type in my distances and then I need my reference in the distance. So I'm gonna put my I variable in there. So now what we've done is, and we're gonna go ahead and, and, and run this, is we should have an object detector that now has spatial information. How far are these detected objects from my robot? So I'm gonna save. And then I'm going to go back to my command line utility and I'm going to get into the right directory. And I'm going to go over into my object detector again, folder. And then what I'm going to do is redeploy the changed application and then run it. So first step is to deploy it. And we come in again, now we're copying the application to the target. And we're going to check to see if there's any changes to the Docker image, I hope not. And there's none. And so then the next thing we're going to do is deploy the model and make sure the virtual environment's all there. So we've done that. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to start. And if I haven't made any coding mistakes, which I sometimes do, and we'll just simply debug it, it should all pop up and we should see some spatial information. So, so far, the demo gods are with me. And, and we'll go ahead and take a look at it. So now we have, as we see in this thing, we have spatial information uh, coming into the object detector. It's bouncing a little bit, but that happens in lighting conditions. That's why you need model retraining. Um, so, um, so there we go. So now we have taken a generic object detector using the RealSense APIs that we have in our platform. We've come out and we've added now spatial elements so our robot knows how far something uh, is away from, from it. Uh, the next thing that I want to do, and I'll start to show you, is we can also use distance information to concentrate the robot on a region of interest. So let me kind of show you what I'm talking about on that. So um, 
Let's go over into another sample application. We're going to call it Real Sense, or we've called Real Sense ROI. So for region of interest. So we're going to come into that and let's deploy and see what the heck I'm talking about. So what we've done here, let me adjust the cup a little bit. So what we've done here, and you can see me coming in actually. So these are the fun of live demos, right? Trying to get the camera, get the right camera angle. So what I've done here is I, and you can see I can come into view or not, is I've taken the, the system and, um, and what I've done is using depth, I've blocked out, uh, 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 basically the background uh, of the system. And what this does is allow your robot to focus into an area and so forth. And as you see, my, my, I can bring my hand into the, uh, into the system. And so as it starts to break that plane and comes close to the distance, you can see it coming in uh, on, on, the, on, on the system itself. So um, what this does is uses spatial information to get, you get your robot focused on a region of, of, of interest. And so let's go ahead and take a look at that API. So we'll come in here and we'll go ahead and um, let me go into the real sense here and let's look, look at the APIs and oddly enough, it's called the region of interest. And so what you do to do that is you get, to get that spatial information into your, into your processing, you go ahead and supply it a depth image, a color image. And then we have these two neat parameters here called min and max and then the shading. But the min and max is what I wanna focus on now. So let's say I leave max at none and I come in and I change the min platform. I mean the min parameter, excuse me. So the min plan, parameter, what it does is it blocks all information uh, in, into the frame up to a certain range. So for example, I set that at one meter, it would block everything in the foreground up to one meter. Now if I leave min at none and I go to the max, and let's say I set the max at two meters, it's gonna block everything from the background on back at, at uh, from two meters on back. Uh, the shade's simply the color of gray that you wanna put out there. So if it's zero, you could have a black background that it's gonna put into the image. Or if it's, if it's all the way up to 255, it'll be a white background. So let's go ahead and see how we're gonna introduce that in the code line. Again, I'm gonna stay away from my horrendous typing skills and I'm gonna go ahead and copy here. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually stop the current thing that's running too, so I don't, and I'm gonna go ahead and let me go back to my IDE and I'm gonna add this. So what we're trying to do now is get results on an ROI. So where I wanna put that into my code line is underneath the capture of my color image and depth image, because those are key uh, elements into our key parameters into my API. So I'm gonna go drop this down let me tab across. And so I'm going to go ahead and again, video stream is how we initiated or instantiated the object. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to push my API and call into this. So now I have ROI and I know it's going to be outputting a frame type to me. So I'm going to call that ROI also. So we now have it set up. So here on the min, we have, uh, you know, I want to keep the min at none for this example. I could set it up if I wanted to but I'm gonna come into the max and I'm gonna set the max at 0.9 meters. And just for kicks, I'm gonna make the background black. So I'm gonna set shade at zero. So that's all I had to do now to put spatial information, you know, adding spatial information that focuses my robot on a region of interest. So now that's added to the code. Uh, uh, and now what I wanna make sure is when I'm going into my object detection, that I actually, process that image coming back, the ROI image with, 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 the, uh, um, with the foreground eliminated at, at 0.9, uh, 0.9 meters. So I'm gonna tie that in, and that means I need to go through and obviously go ahead and do my markup. I wanna make that ROI. So kind of go through the same process we did with color image and make those changes. And again, you can use your find and replace if you want to. I just want to walk through and show everyone where the changes need to do. 
So now we have spatial ROI, ROI information or region of interest information into our code line. So we're gonna go ahead and save this. And then we're gonna go ahead and deploy. And go through the deployment process because we've made code changes. And we, again, hope the demo gods are with us. And I promise after COVID-19, we'll have much more interesting scenes to look at than just my office and my bookshelves and in these webinars. All right, so now we've rebuilt everything. And so now let's go ahead and just start. So there we go. We're gonna go back and boom. And it's still gray, so I don't know why. Oh, you know what? I restarted the sample application. Let me go over to my, my uh, the right directory. So I apologize on that. So we really need to go back into the object detection and do the same thing. So let me go over to my object detector. You saw it was a repeat of my sample code, but let's go to our code change. We wanna deploy. Still wanna deploy. And so again, we're going through the deployment process here, uh, installing the model. And we'll go ahead and we'll type in start. And the reason I knew that I was running on the old one is I've changed the background to black and I saw the gray and I knew that I needed to get over into, my, into the right directory. So let me go and do that and we'll see what I'm talking about. So boom, there we go. And so there, there we go, there's the cuff and, it, and probably a little bit close to the edge, probably should have set it to one meter. But you can start to see it's got the information. Yes, it's live. There's my hand coming in. And so forth. So now we've added a spatial element based upon distancing uh, and so forth. Now, the last thing I want to, to show you um, um, is, is let's, uh, right now what we're doing is we're operating in the pixel realm. And what I want to do is actually now start to move in and how do we find distance between objects that are out there, not from just the camera, where we've used, used the pixel uh, uh, um, width and, and length, but let's now move into a 3D space. Sache uh, talked about, or Dr. Malik talked about that in, it, in, in his talk. So now we wanna move over in the point cloud and we wanna start to find distances between objects uh, in the XYZ plane. And this is called point cloud out there, as you'll hear it referred to. So. In the Always AI, uh, uh, let me go over here, sorry. Within the Always AI, we have that capability. So we have compute distance between objects. So we have, you'll take the bounding boxes of two objects and you can find the distance in XYZ space. So this is our, our first, first attempt to get into the 3D space with the camera. And we'll be building out this fe feature in both the RealSense cameras and, and also the OPD cameras that are out there uh, as we continue to develop on, on these uh, spatial API stuff. But let's take a look at what I'm talking about because I'm kind of rambling. Let's go into our sample application and we're gonna go into the real sense distance this time, distance between. So this will give us in 3D space, the distance between our detected objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, I don't have time to run us through the sample code. It takes a lot of looping and it takes a lot of time to code. So I'm going to go ahead and hopefully this will get started. And there we go. And we're going to go ahead and change this. So now, right now, I don't know what's happening. We're not getting a good detection here. That always happens. So right now what we're doing is we're getting detection. We have a, a chair segment up. Like I said, I don't know going on with the object detector. Let me see if I can get more information in there. Yeah, got less information. Okay, so I'm just gonna, there we go, we got some. So anyway, so let me go ahead and stop. So what we have here now is we can see that between the chair and, and, and the, um, uh, so let's blow this up just a hair. 
So between the chair and the cup now, we know that it's 0.35 meters. We know going out to say, say uh, from the chair to the book, we have 3.7 meters. And then again, uh, from the cup to the, to, to the book, we have uh, uh, 4.0 meters going on. So now what we've done in 3D space is we've actually gotten uh, the distances between uh, the objects and so forth. So that's another powerful spatial element. So now if I have my robot, not only know the distance to my objects, but I also know how they are related in space. And this will allow us to do things like the object avoidance and, and, and so forth. So that's it for today's demos. All the sample code again is up in our, our, our GitHub on that. Uh, go ahead and you can review the, uh, uh, this webinar to do the coding yourself. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Marty. Um, awesome. So we have been receiving uh, just a huge amount of questions during this, this webinar. So we're gonna to get to that in, uh, in a minute and hopefully answer as many as, as we can. But what we'd like to do, so you know, hopefully this gave the developers out there a good sense of the practical use cases for depth cameras and spatial AI, and then also getting into the Oak kit as well as diving really deep into the RealSense camera uh, and seeing the power of the Always AI uh, APIs and how we can we can really help you leverage depth and spatial AI techniques and and actually deploy out on the edge. I should mention that everything that you were seeing, all the inference, all, that was all happening literally live on the edge. There's no cloud inference going on at that point. Uh, and so this is purely an edge deployment, which is what we're very focused on. So find a good use case for your, your depth camera or, or go out and get one if you don't already have one and get started. We'd love to hear about what you're doing. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we have a very active Discord community. Get involved. It's a great way to share ideas and, and hear from other, other developers. Steve's mentioned several times that we are making the, um, the code available through our GitHub repo. And just go ahead and grab that. Uh, go to our docs uh, to get tutorials, videos, how-to guides uh, to help you get going. Um, and we'd love to see uh, some winners out there in, in Satya's OpenCV contest. Obviously, we hope that you would use our platform to help win it. <laughs> that would be great, but uh, good, good luck on that. So we are gonna keep this webinar series going. It's always gonna be very developer focused, very live coding and, and demonstration focused. That's what we're all about. And on that note, I'm going to turn it back over to Komal, who's going to lead the uh, Q&A session. Komal? Thanks, Marty. So we've received a lot of really good questions from the audience throughout this webinar. And um, thank you so much for just engaging so well with this webinar. Uh, the first couple questions are for Satya. So the first one is, Satya, are the Oak devices only available with fixed length? Uh, you mean fixed? Yeah, so the camera is, you, you can see the device here, the camera is actually a fixed, you know, they're fixed to this one, uh, but there are variations of this where we can have an external camera as well. We can cool. connect a real sense camera to it as well. Nice. Um, and will the Oak D be available in the UK? Can you talk about some countries where, where you will be able to ship this camera? We'll be able to ship it anywhere uh, except a few countries prohibited by the United States. Um, you know, that's, that's uh, true about any device, but we'll be able to ship it to any, any, anywhere in the world. Okay. And is the depth info coming from a stereo camera setup or infrared in any form? No, it is a stereo setup. So these are the two cameras. Um, and that's how the depth is being calculated. And this, it also has a 12, uh, 12 megapixel RGB camera on which we do the inference. Okay. What is the range of depth it can measure? Uh, it depends, but you know, up to 10 meters. It, be, it depends on the baseline you know, of this one, but um, up to 10 meters it can do. And there is a minimum also, I think it is uh, about, uh, about a meter. So we go from one meter to up to say 10 meters. Can you, uh, can you describe the difference between the Oak D and the Intel's RealSense D series? 
I'm not very familiar with the real sense uh, D series. Does it actually do neural inference? I, I don't think so, right? It's most of the cameras out there. Uh, first of all, most of the cameras out there, they either do depth or they have the chip embedded in them to do neural inference. But I don't think uh, there are many cameras out there which do both on the same device. So that's uh, a special thing. And I think uh, nobody can beat the price point right now. Uh, the, in the Kickstarter campaign, this thing will be as low as, it could be even lower, but at least um, we, I, can, I can say that it will be about $149 for this uh, one, which is a very difficult price to beat. Wow, that's great. So um, quickly, uh, uh, Kamal, the, the real sense doesn't have inferencing, as, as Dr. Malik pointed out. Um, and then the other piece that it does have, it has infrared, and that's a lot of where we're finding that, that 3D point cloud. So there are differences. They have an effective range, and I, if you're at 10 meters, you're on the edge on their basic camera. They have a 10, 10 meter edge there. And then uh, uh, if you get their most advanced one, you have 20 meters, and then uh, both camera, well, only certain cameras have IMU information. I believe uh, Dr. Malik's camera has IMU information. Well, uh, it's, it's one of the things that we are planning to add if oh. we get a certain, um, certain milestone in Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. So, and again, those are, those are the basic differences. So, um, uh, and again, very important that you can do the inferencing out on the edge, especially with, with uh, devices like the Raspberry Pi and so forth, because uh, they're going to need some offloading as, as you do all the other things with the images and things like that to go present on the, on the CPU. So. Right. But uh, if uh, there is, you know, we also have a version uh, of uh, this camera which we are not actually uh, going to release in the Kickstarter campaign, where the Raspberry comp compute model uh, module comp um, comes integrated with uh, the smart camera. So there you don't really need any external uh, device. So that's uh, something, you know, if there is a company that is interested in it, we can produce it for them. Good. Um, and uh, can you just remind everyone one more time where they can register for the competition competition with the deadline of July 13th? Yes. So the easiest way right now is uh, just go to opencv.org and the front page uh, has a big call out to it. Um, and uh, the link is opencv.org slash opencv dash AI uh, spatial dash AI dash competition. Thank you. Um, in the front page right now. So you, if you go to opencv.org, the, the front page, the biggest button there, uh, it takes you to the competition page. Sweet. Okay. All right. And this next question is for Steve. Is there any way we can measure the depth of an object in front of the camera? And what is the, what is the cup's diameter? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I did say, that. so when they, can you ask the question one more time? I need to. Yeah. It's, is there any way we can measure the depth of an object in front of the camera and what is the cup's diameter? So I'm uh, not sure about cup's diameter, but within, uh, that's a term I don't know. Uh, maybe Dr. Malik can help me out there. But anyway, that's what the initial compute distance on the object was. That's how far that, that cup was away from me. So um, when I did the I initial think, uh, demo, that is the distance to it. So. Dr. Malik, why don't you take on the, the cups? Yeah, so the were... cup diameter is just the diameter of the cups. I was confused. It is just the, 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 the physical size cup. Of the cup. Okay. Steve, Steve, trying to determine the actual size of the cup versus how far away from the camera it is. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so so on that. So again, um, on that, we you have to, that's gonna be an advance on, on the point cloud. So as we move into the point cloud and we add that feature, so I would do something like, uh, what I envision building is I do something like semantic segmentation and so forth on, on that piece and, and, and go ahead and get depth information on each one of those pixels and then I can figure out how far it was. Sasha, you may have a better way or Dr. Malik, you may well, have a better you way. You could also do, if the cups are separated and the uh, resolution is good enough, then you could also do a depth space segmentation so that you get the cup out and then uh, you simply do uh, a segment. So you have a curvature, you have a curved surface of the, de of, the, um, of the cup, and based on that, you can calculate the diameter. It will, 
you need a little bit uh, more information, you know, how yeah. it is closing and the focal length, et cetera, but it can be done. Okay. Uh, and this one is, uh, I believe Eric can help answer this one. Um, the RealSense camera application demo for object detection, uh, the frame inference is about 0 0.68 seconds, which is less than one frames per second. Can we make this inference at five frames per second? And what, and if you could talk also about the object detection model that we are using in the API. Um, yeah, sure. So, and, and Steve and uh, Dr. Malik, feel free to chime in too, because I'm not familiar um, with the, you know, yeah. the, the way that he uh, works at. But just in general, um, a lot of it depends on your edge device itself. Um, choosing an accelerator, like it, and if you're using a Raspberry Pi, getting an NCS stick is going to help out a lot. But it also depends a lot on your model too. Um, in our catalog, we have some uh, inference times um, for the models available, and that's just on a, a straight um, Raspberry Pi, but we're working on getting a, a much more comprehensive list of all of our benchmarking up there uh, to make it really easy to um, pick out a model, a board, um, an accelerator, all that stuff. But yeah, Steve, you had something too? Yeah, so anyway, so what I did today was I just use a basic uh, Raspberry Pi, no acceleration and so forth. So that's the type of inferencing speed that you see, even if I, if you notice, even when I didn't have the depth camera. So what I want to point out in that is a depth camera is doing all the processing uh, and so forth on getting the depth information into that, in, into the uh, 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 object detector. So this was just, hey, I go and buy a Raspberry Pi. This is what a Raspberry Pi can do, which is kind of the, what I call the minimal entering point of, uh, of, of doing computer vision on the edge. And that's what you generally see. Now, you can go ahead and use OpenVINO, which our platform supports, and you can use the Myriad chipset, which come in that NCS2 that you're talking about. You can find that on Amazon or at the Intel site, and you can plug that in and use that back end, and you're going to see five frames per second easily. Uh, uh, on the processing. And that's a TensorFlow SSD that I use today uh, uh, model. Um, and then uh, the other piece is things like if you're using the Jetson Nano, right? Uh, again, that's going to speed it up because you're using GPU processing, which our platform supports. It's also going to help at, at moving the frame around and doing some calculations on, on the frame. Uh, and we have that built in and optimized in the container. So if you're in the Jetson world, well, we're going to speed that up too. You're going to get another kick of acceleration uh, with the GPU and both uh, uh, the interfacing into the depth camera as well as the inferencing into the engine. Uh, I would like to add one more thing. Uh, in Suppose you're using neural compute stick with say Raspberry Pi and you have attached your camera to the Raspberry Pi. The, the way it works is that it first goes into, uh, so the camera you from the camera you get the frame into the raspberry pi and then you load it to the neural compute stick and that's where the inference happens but uh so so there is a delay uh in our system we have the camera directly connected to uh, the MediaDex module and that is why there is no delay it's not even hitting the uh the host computer before uh, you know it does inference and that way, we are four times, at least four times faster than, uh, say, MediaDex. Uh, so, uh, so, sorry, we are at least four times faster than the neural compute stick when it is connected to Raspberry Pi. Not only that, the Raspberry Pi is completely free to do other computation because the load is on this one. Um, so so that's, that's a benefit that this camera is directly connected to the MediaDex module and what you're getting, the host is completely free to do other things. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, we have one more question for Steve. How accurate are the depth measurements? And what is the impact on depth measurements if the light on, object, on the object varies or the background light varies? Yeah, of course, I said that we use the infrared, right? So infrared's gonna have some variation when it has to it, but you know, I do wanna say it's, it's, it's pretty darn accurate, a heck of a lot accurate than estimating pixels like we see out there. A lot of times they're done on the thing and you know, I have spent my time checking. <laughs> <laughs> on those. And it comes out, at least to the degree of this ruler, it comes out pretty darn accurate to that. So uh, uh, the camera has some pretty, it, it, it's pretty, pretty accurate. So. Sweet. 
Um, and then one more for Dr. Malik. What is the field of view of the Oak cameras? Um, and if you could if you could share some information on the frame rate and the illumination requirement. So uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but uh, if you go to that uh, link um, and uh, you know ask the question there, uh, the whole team is there. They have all the specifications ready, and they'll be able to answer. Uh, those questions, but uh, from practically using this, uh, you know, we we do real time object detection on this uh, most of the time, and uh, you know, illumination needs to be reasonable. It cannot be completely dark because the stereo cameras are also based uh, on camera measurement, right? We are not projecting anything onto the uh, onto the environment, so. I would say, you know, reasonable lighting. Uh, it won't work when it is uh, very dark and things like that. So, yeah, with the infrared in, in the real sense, it does work in, in low lighting. Uh, that's that's the whole idea. And then it has been, I, I'm not the real sense product manager. I wanna make sure I'm <laughs> always AI. We just happen to use this one and then, and we will be embracing the oak as it comes out also and other other cameras. So. So yep. I want to make that clear, but they have tested outside, uh, also on 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 the real sense system, uh, so so that it can handle outside lighting, um, and I've done some testing out there, and it, it, it's worked fine. The same accuracy I see inside. So yeah, so the accuracy of real sense will always be uh, better than what we have here, but it's a trade-off. Um, yeah, trade you know, you're getting both of these things together. Um, so I might have replied to somebody that the, uh, our depth measurement would be close to real sense. That's actually not quite accurate. Um, you know, under, uh, under many real world conditions, real, uh, real sense will outperform us, especially in low lighting conditions. So uh, it, it's a trade off really. Good, okay. So um, I'm conscious that we're about six minutes over time. So I will just have one more question. Um, so this can be either uh, for Steve or Dr. Malik. Um, can you use, can I use always AI modules with my OpenCV local installation? Uh, so it's probably more towards me. So I'm not, I am the product manager of always AI. So, so, so I will take this, this, this particular question. And so what we've done is uh, we've containerized OpenCV in, into our environment. We run in a container or if you're running local in a virtual environment. So the answer is, is no, unfortunately, on that. So you need to, to work within our, our platform environment. But we we staying up to, to speed. We're at 412 right now in OpenCV, and we're moving to, to 4.3. And uh, you know, I actively uh, on a daily basis I, I monitor what's going on in, in the OpenCV community and, and so forth. So yeah, you do need to use our, our our platform to get the benefits on it. So, but the case is we build a cross platform. So. You know, if you use our platform and run on x86, it'll run on a NVIDIA device and it, it's all, all there and you don't have to do all the work. So there you go. Sweet. All right. Thank you so much. And um, at this, I'm going to wrap up our Q&A session. I know you guys have lots and lots of really great questions, but at this point, uh, you know, given the time and uh, we're going to just stop here, but if you still have questions, feel free to email me directly or join our Discord channel. Uh, we're, we're constantly taking questions there and responding right away, so we're pretty active here. We look forward to having you on our next webinar. We, As Marty said, we do this every month, so please join us for the next one. Uh, after this webinar, I'm going to send out a link to, uh, all, to everything we covered today. Um, as well as the link to the Kickstarter campaign with Satya as, um, and other details about the competition. So, sorry, it's kind of yeah. loud. So, so quickly, I, I do want to thank Dr. Malik for being part of this. And, and I also want to thank him for OpenCV and everything he's done there. So, and then he does have a blog called Learn OpenCV, which is very, very good. So I do, do want to encourage people to go there too. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Satya. Thank Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Bye.